God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I come to this psalm time and time again. I love this psalm. When I was in the wilderness living in California, yes, in the desert, but also in the wilderness of being a 30-year-old woman with a broken relationship and a broken heart, one of the preachers I visited at a, as a guest uh, visiting a church gave me this psalm and said, meditate on this psalm. It will heal your soul. And it has healed my soul. I'm always mystified at this psalm. I think, what's up with David that he can write such a confident psalm about his relationship with God? When David, <clears throat> y'all know, was a bit of a, a bad guy in some ways. Um, I found this incredible article by this guy named Ushi Derman. And he writes for the, um, he writes for Muck Rock. I, I recommend this. I love digging into these texts and finding out what the Jewish people think about their texts. He says that Jewish people like a faulty hero. And he just makes a list of all the bad guys that get to serve God well. But since we're focused on David, I'll just say that he says David is the faultiest, at the same time the most charismatic. He's got the highest number of titles, cunning in play, a mighty valiant man and a man of war, prudent in matters and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. In other words, David was kind of fine, he was a warrior, and God really loved him. But we really don't know that much about David's childhood, and I like to think that something happened to him in his childhood to shape his personality, because that's how we get to be who we are. We have a life with our parents, our TTs, our nanas, our, our folks, our teachers, and we are formed as a person. Many say by the time we're five, we're just about set at who we're going to be. But David shows up in the text when he's 28, so folks are like digging around in his life trying to figure out what, what it was really like. This one guy, Professor Shinon, a narrative uh, kind of a exegete, if you will, uh, Blames, blames the psalm or blames David's bad behavior on his childhood. Let's just quickly say what the bad behavior was. Middle people have heard me say this before that David had an affair with Bathsheba, right? And killed her husband Uriah so he could keep knocking boots with her. Is that too, is that too earthy for you this morning? Um, that's what happened. <clears throat> So how did that happen? Well, folks like this exegete reminds us that Samuel went to David's house, David's daddy's house, Jesse, to see which of the boys was supposed to be king. And Samuel trots out all the boys, but he doesn't introduce David. Jesse does not introduce David. So Samuel's looking at the kids, looking at the boys. They're young men at this time. Is this all you got? Is this all you have? And Jesse has kept David off to the side. And it feels like Jesse thinks that the oldest son, Eliab, should be king because he's tall, he's good looking, all that kind of stuff. But the scripture says in Samuel uh, that God does not look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So Jesse's like, oh, okay, there's one more boy. He's David, he's the short one, he's the shepherd boy. And it turns out that that's the one that Samuel makes king. Now why did Jesse keep David out of sight? The Midrash, the Jewish teaching behind the text is that David was a boy created out of wedlock. Did you know that, Michael? Okay, I came to startle you with these new facts. <laughs> that in fact, when Jesse got through having his first six kids, he stopped sleeping with his wife, Ninzavet, because he had fallen out of love with her. And he had a crush on the maid. But the wife and the maid conspired. This is juicy, y'all. This is the stuff out of like Hollywood Housewives or something. <laughs> The maid and the wife conspired together to, for her 
the, the wife to dress up like the maid child and put on the maid's perfume and get in the bed in the dark and have sex with Jesse anyway. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. So he thought he was tipping around with the maid, but in fact, it was his own wife and she conceived David that night. Ooh. But nobody knew this except the wife and the maid. So David grows up in the context of being the black sheep in his wealthy, well-to-do family. He's the bastard child. He's the conceived out of wedlock child. Now, if that's true, can you imagine what kind of little boy that, group, that was cooking in his body? Can you imagine the insecurity of being the shortest, of being the outcast, of being the not in the main flock, one of the sheep being cast outside to be a shepherd boy. When I heard that story growing up, I thought, well, Jesse just wanted him to be a shepherd boy, but it seems that he was put out in a way. And that's the boy that gets made king. And that's the boy who maybe has just enough brokenness in his soul to not really feel fabulous and shiny and special. And maybe that's why he's driven and maybe that's why he's got poor boundaries and maybe that's why he ends up with the Sheba. Is everybody still with me as I went down the road with David there? Do any of you have things in your story, in your life that make you sometimes feel insecure outside of the main frame, not the shiny one? Raise your finger if you got something. <coughs> raise your finger, because we're, you know, in a Baptist type church, you raise your finger. Raise your finger if somebody rejected you when you were a little kid on the playground. Raise your finger if you didn't feel like you were the shiniest one in your family. Raise your finger if when you were discovering your sexuality, somebody made you feel like you weren't special after all. Raise your finger if you were a girl child in a family where the boys got to do and you didn't. Raise your finger if when you went to grammar school, you found out that you did not belong because you were Jewish or Christian or Catholic or raise your finger. Raise your finger if your first lover first made you feel so special and then kind of broke your heart. Raise your finger if you've been wounded in this nation. Raise your hand, raise your fist if America has not always been a safe container for you to become shiny, fabulous, amazing, good you because it's a hot mess up in here. This nation is not designed for our flourishing. This nation is competitive and the marginalized don't count and the centered ones stay centered and the discourse is toxic and the politics are broken. This nation claiming to be a democracy is in fact a place built on stolen land by stolen labor and all of that stuff that's in there is still in there. That's why January 6th. That's why George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey. That's why a mother will drive her child across state boundaries with a gun in the car so he can go hunt some people. That's why the ministries of Middle Church and the Riverside Church are so important, so mission critical because we have got to be the ones to heal the world with love. All of the world's major religions have a calling for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
Rabbi Jesus picks up those texts from Deuteronomy and Leviticus when he's asked by the rich young ruler, what's the most important commandment? Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, love, period. And all the rest of that stuff is midrash and commentary. My sense is that people are doing exactly what the scripture says that they are loving their neighbor as they love themselves. And since they don't love themselves, they're not loving their neighbor well, not at all well, not at all well. Because insecure people hurt people. Come on, somebody. Hurt people hurt people. Wounded people wound people. Broken people break people. I find myself feeling sorry for our electeds who don't have a holy imagination to see you and me in the story. And I think we are called to find a way, you and me, as justice warriors, to love ourselves fiercely so that we can actually keep the command, the command of Jesus, to love yourself and your neighbor equally. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a child growing up, loving myself was not what I was taught. My parents loved me, don't misunderstand, but they didn't go, now Jackie, you need to really love you. No, I needed to self-sacrifice. I needed to empty myself. I needed as the oldest girl child to like give away, give away, give away. And, and between my already early wiring to be a perfectionist and the churchy stuff I experienced as a little girl, y'all know what I'm talking about? all the don'ts, right? Don't, 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 don't. I found myself growing up with a mask on. There was a big space between who I was and who I thought I needed to be in order to survive. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does anybody else operationalize their mask at work? Their mask at home? Their mask at church? Their mask in their community? I'm masked so you won't see my faults and flaws and my vulnerabilities, come on. And all that energy that we're putting into masking ourselves is energy that could be put into loving ourselves authentically. Not because we're perfect, but because we're not. My professor Jim Loder defined love as the non-possessive delight in the unique particularity of the other. Can I say that again? The non-possessive delight in the unique particularity of the other. Oh, that's so juicy. I have the kind of love for my husband, John, for my grandkids, but it has taken me just about 62 years to have that kind of love for myself. In other words, to love the other up in me, to love the parts of me I don't like, to love the parts of me that make me feel ashamed, to love the parts of me that make me feel alien to me. My temper could be one, but I don't want to bore you with my list. <laughs> I want to invite you to think about yours. What's the part of you that you want to keep hidden? What's the part of you that feels foreign to you, that makes you want to distance yourself from it or mask it so no one sees it? That part of you, your little person that was hurt, your larger person who made a mistake, your own temper, your fearful self, that part of you needs love from you so you can grow it all the way up. So you can be a whole person and love the whole of you. And the whole of you will love the whole world. And the whole of you will love the one who is other to you that's a little bit like your worst self. And then we'll have a journey of reconciliation. Who knows what I'm talking about? You, Riverside family, and you, middle family, are used to me giving you the justice, let's go do it, let's go heal it, let's go fix it, let's march for Black Lives Matter, let's march for voting rights. Yes, yes, yes. But in this season, on the way to the holy days, I want us to be on a journey of loving ourselves 
so that the work we do flows from our own sense of abundance and gratitude and self-acceptance for who we are. Every place you've been broken, every place you've been hurt, every place where I've been broken and hurt is the place where my love muscle can grow even more profoundly. Now, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna love ourselves by being honest with ourselves. Take off your mask and look in the mirror and see there what David calls awesomely, wonderfully made in the image of Godness. Who's got a mirror? Take out your mirror, take out your iPhone, flip it around. Seriously, I'm not kidding. Let's, let's take a look. <laughs> You are shining with God's glory, created a little less than God, we're told in the Psalms. You are absolutely, fantastically, amazingly created in the image of the holy. It's almost sacrilegious to not love yourself, my people. The second lesson that we were read today says, everywhere love is, God is. God tabernacles, takes up residence, lives in you when you love. If you're the seat of the holy, you got to love your seat. I mean yourself. God is in you, flowing through you, taking up space in you wanting to be excreted out of your pores, blown out of your breath, spoken out of your mouth, prayed through your prayers, activated through your activism, transforming the world because you are transformed and you can't do that work. While there's parts of you you can't love. I want you to love yourself ferociously, fiercely, fantastically, fantabulously. I want you, like Intazaki Shage says, to love God, find the God in yourself, and love her fiercely. This is moral courage, to look at you and love you. What kind of people will we be if we don't? May it be so. Amen.